There is Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, who was on television last night begging people for money. They're trying to destroy Donald Trump because they fear him at the ballot box. To the conservatives out there, make sure you vote. If you got friends, make sure they vote. If you don't have any friends, go make some friends. But you need to help this man, Donald J. Trump. They're trying to drain him dry. He spent more money on lawyers than most people spend on campaigns. They're trying to bleed him dry. DonaldJTrump.com. Go tonight. Give the president some money to fight this. Joe, I was going to say Lindsey Graham was dispatched to do that, but they don't even have to get the order anymore. They know their job <laughs> is to, to run out that. on TV and to yeah. raise money. Uh, we go back to this again, I, Joe. Donald Trump ah, so constantly sense. hustles his supporters for money. Is yeah. he a billionaire or is he not? The legal fee should be a rounding error in his checking account, but he's constantly hustling his own supporters for money to pay his well, legal bills. And again, he's always lying to his supporters to get them to give him money for something else. And then he spends it on his legal fees. But I got to say, looking at that, that was Rev, you know, I always talk about the Jim and Tammy Faye Baker mm -hmm. uh, uh, approach to politics. They're scamming uh, people like my grandmother out of their Social Security checks, $25 here, $50 there. I've got to say that Lindsey Graham moment, he's tearing up. Lindsey knows what a bad man Donald Trump is. Lindsey's the one who said that if we make him our nominee, he will destroy the Republican Party and we deserve it. But Lindsey almost crying there, almost, uh, yes, get, please give. That reminded me of Oral Roberts climbing <laughs> up into his tower back in the 80s saying, give me three million dollars yeah. or I'm not coming down from this tower. I yeah, mean, he, he did. He said he was going to lose his life. He said he was going to die. die. Yeah, yeah. Give me three million dollars or I'm going to die up here in this tower. But the thing is, just like Kevin McCarthy, Kevin McCarthy knows what a bad man Donald Trump is. He says it privately to anybody who will listen. Then he goes out and he's willing to throw America's judicial system uh, under the bus. And Lindsey Graham there crying like Oral Roberts on top of his tower on, give and us more one. money. I mean, how much money has Donald Trump raised off of the big lie? How much money has he raised for legal fees already? Because I, I think a little a little bit here about what happens at the morning Joe table. Um, I think the history of this moment is the big story today. I think if there were viewers or people coming right now expecting to see hysteria or glee, um, there's nothing to report on. We don't know what is in this indictment. And so for those who are, you know, screaming and crying on the air about um, weaponization of the government or collusion with the Biden White House or all sorts of other things that have led to this moment that are baseless, completely baseless. It's not responsible. Right now, we don't know what is in there, but we do know that this is a really sad moment and a perilous moment in American history because of the potential consequences of a former president being indicted and what that might open the door to. But right. if the indictment has legitimate laws broken, then there was no other choice but to move forward, and that said. Well, and, and, and I think we've all been saying it here, which is, uh, again, two things can be true at once. This is, this is crossing the Rubicon, yeah. and there's no going back, and the consequences of this could be horrific. You could have uh, a prosecutor in West Texas decide to go after the next Democratic president, uh, and, 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 and then you could have uh, a Democratic uh, DA doing the same thing. And so, yeah, that's, that may be the Rubicon that we've crossed at the same time as Peter points out. And as John's pointed out, you also have the very, very American concept. And there are those of us who still actually believe in America love America and and want to defend the rule of law in America, despite of the fact that a lot of people love a former game show host uh, who started riots and, and behaved abhorrently. Uh, there's a lot of us that still believe that in this country, no man is above the law. Mm.
And so there is a balancing act. Two things can be true at once. If you turn the, the I, I will say, moment. if you turn this on, expected anybody to be gleeful on this show. You're not reading the room right. This is these are very perilous times. Yes. It's not to say that that perhaps after we read the uh, indictment, we won't say, well, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but but uh, there is so much at stake, so much on the line. Uh, the, we should probably treat this um, a little bit differently than we treat, let's say, Red Sox baseball games. Right. Which right. on that point didn't start we'll out well yesterday. We'll get to that. Okay. So Still no one is above the law, including former presidents. Let me be clear on that point. And, and uh, the American people know this. But in this case, and, and a controversy over campaign finance, I can't speak to the merits of this case at all, but I, I can speak to the, the issue emanating out of a question over campaign finance should never have risen to the level to bring an, an unprecedented and historic prosecution. So against should the Trump have president. been treated differently than Michael Cohen, who went to jail for doing this? Well, my, Michael Cohen went to jail for, for lying to Congress. Look, <laughs> this is an issue about campaign finances, and, it, and it's a tenuous at best. I'm really I'm so confused. Willie, no man is above the law, but in this case, Donald Trump is above the law. That's that's the argument they have to make, that no man is above the law except for a failed reality TV show host who said, let's terminate the Constitution. And then and, and, and the, 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 the thing is, they're saying it about this case now. Mm. Then watch them say it about the Georgia case. Then watch them say it about the documents case. If indictments and then there. watch them say it about the January 6th case, whichever of those cases may come, they're always, they're always going to defend the failed reality TV show host over the rule of law, over the Constitution, over the military, over the intel community, over American colleges, over every institution that's made this country great. Because for some reason, they believe we're a nation of men and not a nation of laws. Right. It's either true or not that no one is above the law. So you can't say no one is above the law, comma, but, and then it's say why one person is above the law yeah. in this case. And, and you're right. They and Donald Trump, his supporters in, in Congress and Mike Pence and others are laying the predicate in this first case. Again, we don't know what's inside this indictment. We don't know what the case against the former president is, but they're at least laying the predicate for they're, this is a weaponization. The Justice Department is going after Donald Trump just because they don't want him to be president again. And now they can use that again in Georgia when that comes up. They can use that again right. when the special counsel, if he decides to prosecute in the January 6th case, in the documents case at Mar-a-Lago. This will be the argument that they're only doing all of this to prevent Donald Trump from being president again. That's the argument. Yeah, and, and, and by the way, it's not just the January 6th writers. I love the Bard of Bell Mead, John Meacham talking about the men's grill enablers. <laughs> These line. people that try to have it both yeah. ways that you, you, you know, and you and I, we've, you, you and me, we've seen this all the time. People come up and go, oh, I can't stand this guy. This guy, I hate this. Oh, he's well. the worst. He's horrible for the party. He's horrible. And then these men, men's grills and enablers will go on TV. You look at Glenn Young, and he's a perfect example. And all these other people go on, and then they'll say, oh, the weaponization of the rule of law. It's just such nonsense. It's also irresponsible because we don't know what's in the indictment. And there's a, a baseless accusation about any type of collusion or the rule of law being abused. But that's a little fact check to what the former vice president said about Michael Cohen. Cohen was. And Reverend Al, you, we would love for you to tell us more about uh, Alvin Bragg, the DA, uh, who has been uh, the, the target of death threats, uh, the man who uh, Republicans like Ron DeSantis are, are using, actually, well, you, using uh, old uh, anti-Semitic tropes against uh, his supporters, saying that he's nothing but a lackey for a Jewish international banker, the old George Soros line that all these Republicans are shamelessly using was anti-Semitic trope. Of course, Donald Trump has called him a racist against white people 
Um, so, uh, and, 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 and an animal. Um, tell, tell us about, about the DA, uh, who's now uh, suddenly at the center of the world's attention. Well, uh, Alvin Bragg is a very solid uh, family man. Sunday school teaches, teaches uh, Sunday school at his church in Harlem, born, raised in Harlem, uh, went uh, to Harvard uh, 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 Law School. And in Harvard, they talk about how when there was a controversial black activist that was uh, invited to speak at Harvard, it was Alvin that tried to get both sides to understand why they would bring this controversial black activist. And then not long after that, they had a, uh, a white professor that had advocated things that were considered anti-black, and he wanted that guy heard. And they said, this guy's got uh, some real uh, uh, kind of balance with him. That's the Alvin Bragg uh, we know in Harlem. He comes by National Action Network all the time, even on our youth nights when I'm not there. So he's a solid guy. Why well, say that all to say, Joe, that he's not the kind of guy that would play politics. He would not indict anyone, including Donald Trump, to get political capital or to serve some political supporters. And by the way, uh, Soros did not directly support him. He supported a group that ended up supporting Bragg. So I think that uh, uh, people need to remember this is the same Alvin Bragg that would not prosecute Trump a year ago and was heavily attacked by many on the left and many in the media. So he is so deliberate. He did not do it at that time, felt there was no case. So one must suspect that there are factors we don't know that made Alvin Bragg a year later take this step. And we will not know that until this indictment is unsealed and we go to trial. But Alvin is not manipulated by anybody and motivated by politics. Michael Beschloss, would love to get uh, get some final thoughts from you on uh, this historic moment we find ourselves in. Well, I think the one thing, you know, I've been trying to think, Joe and Mika and Willie and Jonathan and everyone else, I've been trying to think where in history have we heard of a defendant like Donald Trump and the people who support him saying that there should be public demonstrations and implying that mm -hmm. judges and juries and the legal process should be intimidated. Two big memories in history. This is where this is coming from. Number one, organized crime. How many times in history have we seen a master criminal, uh, including John Gotti, who Trump supposedly jokingly says that he venerates, people around them intimidating judges or even threatening assassination. That's number one. Number two, white supremacists, gangs, not only in the South, who disagree with a verdict or may disagree with a prosecution, try to intimidate a judge or even go into a jail and pull someone who's been sentenced to a life in prison out and lynch that person. These are the two precedents for what Donald Trump and his friends are saying. They are to be very much watched for and make sure that we don't go down that road again. Well, and, and I'm so glad you brought that up because it actually allows us to see how this historically is specific only to Donald Trump, Michael, because you didn't hear Republicans doing this when Richard Nixon was facing impeachment. Absolutely. When Richard Nixon Absolutely. was facing crime. You didn't hear this when Spiro Agnew Absolutely. was charged with tax evasion. In fact, you had Republicans, Barry Goldwater, the most conservative Republican, walking to the White House and saying to Nixon, hey, the gig is up. Get right. out. And so, so again, this, this is something that this is, this is specific to Trump, isn't it? It's not even specific to Republicans historically. Sure it is. And again, look who his heroes are. You know, mobsters, white supremacist gangs. You know, you tell a lot by who someone's heroes are, and it, it's beginning to look at, as if, at least in this case, those are his. Mm. Michael Beslas and Claire McCaskill, thank you both for being on this morning. Dave, thanks so much uh, for, for, first of all, being in touch with me the past couple of days because you've given me the heads up. You said, you said look at the space with Weisselberg. Something's going on there. And you weren't so sure that the indictment was going 
to wait two or three weeks. You had a feeling this might happen. First of all, tell me why. And also, why do we keep hearing Alan Weisselberg's name uh, continuing to come up over the past two, three days? What have you been hearing uh, that, that, that tipped your hand to this? Yeah, good morning, Joe. The timetable that we're all uh, expecting here was because it was set by Donald Trump. And that's why I thought you shouldn't believe that timetable of Tuesday or bust. All signs were pointing to an indictment sooner than later because they invited Trump to the grand jury to testify. That's usually the end game. And they had Michael Cohen testify, who was the punctuation mark of all this. So I'm not surprised that we saw an indictment. I thought that there would be multiple felonies that we did not expect. It was beyond the Stormy Daniels mm -hmm. payments, and that may be the case. And the reason why I thought that way, Joe, was because we heard that Jennifer Weisselberg testified before the grand jury. Jennifer Weisselberg is the ex-daughter-in-law of longtime Trump Organization CFO Alan Weisselberg. She doesn't seem to have any inside knowledge about the Stormy Daniels payments, but she would seem to have knowledge about the internal finances of the Trump Organization. You know, she would be at the dinner table when this conversation would occur. And she's an estranged ex-daughter-in-law. She has a lot to say to prosecutors. So that led me to believe that this is more than just payments of Stormy Daniels. Now, we don't know. I think a lot of the counts are probably conspiracy counts, but don't be surprised if there are other counts there that haven't been discussed, like perhaps uh, bank fraud, insurance fraud, other types of things that can make this a lot more serious. Also, Jennifer Weisselberg would be a very valuable witness in the trial, but a more valuable witness would be Alan Weisselberg. He knows where all the bodies are buried. So expect prosecutors in Manhattan to continue to pressure Alan Weisselberg to flip on Donald Trump. They're going to pressure him with a possible insurance fraud charge because Alan Weisberg is nearing the end of his sentence at Rikers Island. He's 75 years old. He does not want to renew his room reservation there in prison. Yeah, and it's interesting when he was being sent to prison, Donald Trump, who's actually older than Weisselberg, said, look what they are doing to that poor old man. Uh, but but there is, there, again, some interesting bits of information in the news accounts uh, that you're hearing about this, including the fact that Bragg, uh, according to sources, has communications uh, between Trump organization uh, members. Uh, and so, again, it, it is. Some things seem to be pointing to, to perhaps uh, something that's going to bring Mr. Weisselberg back into this. Dave, I'm also wondering, um, he can't help himself. Ron DeSantis embarrassed himself by saying he was going to fight extradition charges like he has any say. I mean, again, one more Republican that really just doesn't give a damn about the Constitution of the United States. Uh, and, of course, you've got you, 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 you to uh, just... What's this line? Look at the Soros back. No, it's just Jews. They're attacking Jewish no. international bankers. It's what anti-Semites have been doing for hundreds of years, attacking Jewish international bankers. And that's what they do. They try to blame everything on Jewish international bankers. It's Germany, 1933. But why does Ron DeSantis further embarrass himself by saying, I'm going to ignore the Constitution and I'm not going to extradite Trump to New York? Yeah, I, I saw that tweet, Joe. And look, he already knew that Donald Trump was saying through his lawyers that he was not going to fight extradition. I I'm not so sure. You know, it doesn't seem in character for Trump to surrender voluntarily. So he may try to fight extradition and the ball then would go into DeSantis's court. But here's the deal here in the fact that the alleged criminal conduct occurred in New York while Donald Trump was a resident of New York means that this is in the category of a fugitive extradition. And that oh. means that DeSantis has no power to stop the extradition. He can delay it possibly a few months at most. But New York would then go to federal court and get an order of extradition. It's not hard to get in a case like this. Now, where DeSantis has some power is to try to stop a future extradition to Georgia, because that would be a non-fugitive mm -hmm. extradition. Trump wasn't there at the time the alleged criminal conduct occurred. But that's why in this case, even though it looks like the Georgia case is stronger than the New York case, the extradition to New York will be easier than any extradition to Georgia. And here's one more thing. One reason why Trump may indeed surrender rather than go and fight extradition is to prevent DeSantis from looking like the protector 
He doesn't want DeSantis to look like the alpha dog because in the MAGA world <sighs> where image and symbolism mean everything, Trump doesn't want to make DeSantis look strong while Trump looks weak. But Claire, let me pull you in here. If let's talk about Georgia and, and just for argument's sake, as law professors would do uh, in our law classes, just for argument's sake, let's say Donald Trump gets indicted in Georgia and for some reason Ron DeSantis tries to stop him uh, facing justice in Georgia for potentially trying to rig an election. The Supreme Court of the United States ultimately would reverse, reverse that in about 15 seconds, would they not? Yeah, it is um, really. I think the tweet that Ron DeSantis did yesterday should be put on a marquee with flashing lights because he has now revealed who he is. Yeah. He has revealed that this is all about performance politics with him. Uh, this is a Harvard-educated lawyer. Uh, he knows that article, there's an article in the Constitution that specifically forbids what he said yesterday, specifically addresses uh, the Founding Fathers, specifically talked about that executives of state shall cooperate with other jurisdictions when laws are being enforced. So, and he, uh, frankly, I can't imagine that Trump is going to do anything other than surrender. I think Alvin Bragg would just want him to quietly surrender. I think the country should want him to quietly surrender. And so, you know, DeSantis knows that. So he is now telling America, I am just as vacuous as Donald Trump. The, the substance of it doesn't matter. I am willing to say and do anything. And the irony here is he tweeted that he would violate the U.S. Constitution in order to win a nomination to become president, to put his hand in the air and swear over a Bible that he will uphold and defend the Constitution. So come on, get, uh, give me a break. What? I mean, this is really embarrassing it's a clown and very show. undignified. It's a clown show. Yeah, really bad for the country. Political theater there from Governor Sanders. We should also note Trump's lawyer just this morning reiterated his intent that he will surrender, that he's not going to fight uh, extradition. Um, Caroline, let's talk about, we don't know, obviously, everything that's in the indictment. That's going to be a few days before we do. But from what we, we are aware of the case, what is your assessment as to the charges that could come and the prosecution that would follow? And is it complicated? This is going to be on a state level rather than federal. Absolutely. You know, we've heard about Michael Cohen, who has previously been indicted at a federal level um, in the Southern District of New York for conduct related to sort of this overall hush money scheme. Again, it's not illegal to uh, pay hush money. What we're talking about here is the documentation of it on Trump Org's financial disclosure forms. Um, you know, unconfirmed reporting is that there's 34 counts potentially in this indictment. I don't think Bragg would move forward with an indictment that wasn't kicked up to a felony charge. You know, we've now all heard that these are sort of misdemeanor offenses. However, prosecutors can kick it up to a class E felony if they can show that the misdocumentation of the payments were done in furtherance of an additional crime. And as Claire noted, th that's where this prosecution gets really tricky because that additional crime is could be a federal campaign finance law violation in the form of the hush money payment was, in fact, a contribution to the campaign just days before the election. It wasn't merely a personal payment to save Trump from the embarrassment uh, from his wife and, and others that he had, you know, potentially had an affair. So there are multiple issues with this prosecution. I think D.A. Bragg has a long road ahead of him. Um, you know, at a base level, you have to prove <clears throat> knowledge and intent. Um, and, you know, intent to really defraud, not just intent to, to, to hide the payment. So legal scholars are asking, well, well, who was, you know, who was he intending to defraud? I think with the addition of Weisselberg, we're hearing it could potentially be New York State tax authorities. So there could be tax violations involved here. There are a myriad of sort of uh, avenues through which Bragg could move this prosecution. And, and adding to the, the whole uh, myriad of, 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 of things that Bragg would be facing. Would he not also know that the Trump attorneys would be going to some level of appeals courts to try to overturn the indictment or stop it? And therefore, you would assume that they have uh, uh, various uh, parts of the indictment that 
they feel would survive whatever appeals process that the Trump organization and or Trump himself would come uh, and try to overturn this indictment. Absolutely. So in order to get an indictment, the standard is just probable cause that a crime has been committed. However, in a situation like this, you have to know that Bragg feels much stronger about that. Obviously, you know, the, the, the standard to convict is beyond a reasonable doubt. And uh, where it gets tricky, as you noted, is, is it's true. This federal election law violation theory in order to kick up the misdemeanor charge to a felony has not been tested at a trial level in New York State state court. It has been used in some instances for guilty pleas and things of that nature. So there are sort of some precedents here. However, you know, you can't help but like in this case to the John, John Edwards case with the payments right. to Rael Hunter. You know, that that was a federal case. Um, and, you know, it was a sort of a similar theory that these payments were not, in fact, personal. However, they were made for his campaign that fell apart. You know, he was acquitted on one of the counts. The, the um, prosecutors declined to move forward with that prosecution. It's a shaky theory in, in, in the world of the federal land. Um, mm. Having it as the back channel in this state prosecution is even more risky. Law enforcement is preparing for potential protests in the wake of the indictment of former President Trump. The NYPD issued a memo yesterday requiring all officers to be prepared for deployment in the case of, quote, unusual disorder. There is reason why police are taking seriously the potential for violence in the wake of Trump's indictment. Nearly two weeks ago, Trump called for mass protests. He referred to the Manhattan DA as an animal and a danger who should be removed. He told his supporters the country is being destroyed and that prosecutors are doing the work of the devil. Call, call them the Gestapo. He amplified a threatening image suggesting the DA could be beaten with a baseball bat and warned of death and destruction if he is held accountable. Couple that with his loaded language in the past about guns and Hillary Clinton. And his continuing praise of the January 6th insurrectionists, including his collaboration with members of a prison choir a, a choir who are incarcerated yeah. for attacking police. Yeah. <laughs> Joining us now, former New York City Police Commissioner, the now executive chairman of the Teneo Risk, uh, Bill Bratton, and former Secretary of Homeland Security under President Obama, Jay Johnson. Mr. Joins Mr. Us. Commissioner, what would uh, you be doing this morning as Commissioner of, uh, of NYPD? I'm, so, I'm sorry, Joe, I did not hear the question. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just curious. What would you be doing just to prepare to, to, to prevent the next January 6th if you were running the NYPD again? Well, the police commissioner is very busy here in her department. Uh, it begins to see some of that yesterday with the increased security around the courthouse, district attorney's office. Security has been increased significantly, certainly, for the district attorney and others. And the good news is that uh, New York has great experience dealing with every type of experience in terms of whether it be terrorism or large crowds, demonstrations. And in this event, uh, they will be watching very closely, uh, monitoring social media, intelligence sources. Uh, I don't think you're going to see huge crowds turning out for this thing, particularly from the Trump side. Uh, uh, Mr. Trump is not thought very well of here in New York and in Manhattan. I think you're going to have larger crowds that will be demonstrating against him rather than in support of him. In any event, the police department will be prepared to deal with it. Commissioner Bratton, good morning. Yeah, the, when Donald Trump first said, I'm going to be arrested on Tuesday a couple of weeks ago, there was a small smattering, a handful of Trump supporters downtown protesting. Um, can you speak, though, as someone who has obviously served at the top of the New York Police Department, about the kind of resources it has, the kind of intelligence it has, and that, why it would be much, much more difficult and probably unwise for people to try to incite violence in lower Manhattan? My predecessor, Commissioner Kelly, after the events of 9-11, created uh, a entity, almost a thousand officers working on intelligence gathering, counterterrorism. Jay Johnson, who I work very closely with, sitting beside me here when he was Homeland Security Secretary during my last time as Commissioner. Uh, it's an example of the close collaboration that exists here in New York City. And New York uh, does an extraordinary job analyzing, gathering intelligence, monitoring social media. 
So these demonstrations right now, they're not picking up much information about planned demonstrations. They're actually more concerned about the lone wolf, the person that they don't pick up on social media, they don't hear from. Uh, at the same time, they have phenomenal resources to bring into this issue. Last week, in anticipation of an action last week, they fielded uh, uh, what they called uh, mobile field forces. They put out 10 of them. That's over 400 offices scattered around lower Manhattan that could respond very quickly to any unplanned uh, merging uh, situation. Now, the NYPD, working in coordination with their counterparts and other agencies, will be very well prepared for this. So, Mr. Secretary, we just went through the, what could happen, may or may not happen, in lower Manhattan, and there was just a small group of protesters last week. We also know that this morning in Palm Beach, near Mar-a-Lago, a very small group of demonstrators there as well. Mm -hmm. But it's a big country. Um, from the sitting, taking a look back from your former job, looking at the entire nation, there are certainly... Yes. Donald Trump has fervent supporters throughout the country. What steps do you think federal law enforcement right now is taking in case something else were to erupt, perhaps not outside the courthouse, but in a Trump stronghold? Well, first, I want to echo what Bill said. Uh, I have a lot of confidence in the NYPD. In 2015, uh, when Bill was commissioner and I was secretary, we managed probably the largest domestic security operation in history with the U.N. General Assembly of 170 world leaders plus the Pope. Mm. Uh, so I'm sure the NYPD will be prepared here in New York. They know how to do this kind of thing. On the national scale, I am very concerned that former President Trump has abandoned all moderation in his rhetoric. It is overheated rhetoric. What he is essentially doing uh, in talking to his base, those who, as John put it, under are still under his spell, it's is basically take up arms against our government, state and local. And particularly after January 6th, uh, uh, Mr. Trump ought to know the consequences of this kind of rhetoric. You know, he will swear that I did not intend violence by my rhetoric, uh, but there's a point where you do intend the consequences of your actions. And we've seen this with January 6th. I'm very concerned that this could be a repeat of that. I know that the Department of Homeland Security right now, as we speak through its intelligence and analysis uh, directorate, is closely monitoring social media, all of its sources, just as is the NYPD and the FBI looking for potential demonstrations that could turn violent on a national level, whether it's here in New York or Mar-a-Lago or any place else. And I think they need to be vigilant right now, given the former president's very overheated rhetoric. Secretary, uh, having said that, uh, on the other side of it, there are a lot of emotions, people that have been anti-Trump, anti what he uh, mm -hmm. stands for, I among them. How would you counsel them? Because one of the things we've been saying overnight is don't play into it. Do not uh, be the ones that uh, come out and try to go, as we would say, tit for tat with those that uh, would express sure. anger and would want to see violence. Uh, how would you counsel people uh, that we're looking at a moment that we ought not be celebrating? Because it's a sad moment to see a former president have to do this, even though we feel it could lead to justice. How would you counsel the anti-Trump crowd that may uh, show up as the uh, a police commissioner here has said? Peaceful demonstration, the right to protest is part of our, our values, our heritage, our history and our culture. Um, as you know, Reverend, uh, Martin Luther King would counsel demonstrations, protests, but always peaceful. Uh, after George Floyd, uh, many people, millions of Americans, took to the streets and protested in a peaceful manner. I count myself as a protester right. for some of the marches I was in after George Floyd, as you were. Yeah. And so... Uh, peaceful demonstration, uh, the peaceful exercise of our First Amendment rights and our freedom to assemble uh, is part of who we are as Americans, but always peaceful. Commissioner Bratton, we want to turn to you for a fact check if we can. One of the uh, talking points emanating from the right uh, in the aftermath of this indictment is saying that D.A. Bragg, that he's too focused on Donald Trump and ignoring the crime that's happening in his backyard, the crime that's happening in Manhattan. Can you provide some context as to whether there's any truth at all to that point? What is the D.A. and NYPD doing about crime each and every day here in New York City? The district attorney's office in Manhattan is a very large operation. They have the capability to 
do multiple things at the same time. So the idea of the focus of his office on this case certainly attracting a lot of resources to it. At the same time, he's got a very large operation to continue to focus on the crime situation. I've been a critic of the uh, district attorney relative to his crime fighting uh, in this city, so make that known. But at the same time, his office is very capable of do doing uh, the, the investigation of Mr. Trump's activity, while at the same time trying to focus more actively on the crime situation in New York. We've been reading from Peter Baker's great analysis in the New York Times this morning in light of the indictment of Donald Trump, entitled, A President Faces Prosecution and a Democracy is Tested. Peter writes in part, for all of the focus on the tawdry details of the case, or its novel legal theory, or its political impact, the larger story is of a country heading down a road it has never traveled before, one fraught with profound consequences for the health of the world's oldest democracy. For more than two centuries, presidents have been held on a pedestal. Even the ones swathed in scandal, declared immune from prosecution while in office, and effectively, even afterward, no longer. That taboo has been broken. A new precedent has been set. Will it tear the country apart? As some feared about putting a former president on trial after Watergate? Will it be seen by many at home and abroad as victor's justice akin to developing nations where former leaders are imprisoned by their successors? Or will it become a moment of reckoning? A sign that even someone who was once the most powerful person on the planet is not above the law. Michael Beschloss, Peter also says, well, the indictment of Mr. Trump takes a country in uncharted waters. The authors of the Constitution might have been surprised only that it took so long. Uh, president impeached by the House and convicted and removed from office by the Senate, quote, shall nevertheless be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to the law, Article 1, Section 3 of the Constitution declare. So ex-presidents says the Constitution, the writers of the Constitution, shall be liable and subject to indictment, trial, judgment, and punishment according to the law. We've never done it before. Well, we're doing it now with this <laughs> indictment, just as the founders of the Constitution foresaw. Uh, we are seeing that happen, and especially because you know, impeachment has sadly turned out to be a toothless remedy. You know, all of us, Mika and Joe, sat through those two Trump impeachments, and the result was foreordained from the beginning. He was always going to win in the end and get off. Impeachment is not something that's going to strike fear into the heart of any president, especially Donald Trump. But now that an ex-president has been indicted, you know, we've turned this presidency from this punishment-free zone, which it has been for over two centuries, at least in terms of criminal punishment, and now cause presidents to think that they have to, to live by the same laws that the rest of us do. And the other thing is, are we going to live in a system of mob rule when Donald Trump puts up a social media post with his baseball bat, with D.A. Bragg at the right, essentially threatening violence against the D.A. And when he and his supporters threaten that mobs in the streets, groups of domestic terrorists maybe, will descend on judges or juries or those who are in favor of prosecution of Donald Trump, that's mob law. If we give in to that, we're overturning everything that the founders believed. Let's bring into the conversation former White House Director of Communications to President Obama, Jennifer Palmieri. She's co-host of Showtime's The Circus, Pulitzer Prize winning associate editor of The Washington Post, Bob Woodward, congressional investigations reporter for The Washington Post, Jackie Alamany, and NBC News justice and intelligence correspondent Ken Delanian. Jonathan Lemire, the Reverend Al Sharpton, still with us as well. A great panel assembled for this conversation. And Bob Woodward, I will begin with you. You've seen an awful lot in your time as a reporter. But you've never seen this because no one has a former president of the United States indicted. We'll learn what the charges are against him. That is a sealed indictment. So we don't know what the case is just yet. But just your reaction to the simple fact of a president being indicted. Well, it's extraordinary, but I, I think we have to get a perspective on this. Uh, as they say, who has the A shares here? And that is the special counsel. Uh, 
that uh, they have the authority and uh, access to the FBI, to federal grand juries. Uh, this is going to take months, if not a year, to resolve all of the investigations that are going on. And this is the real threat, particularly uh, the January 6th insurrection. There is evidence on the record, uh, an abundance of evidence that Trump uh, incited this, supported this. This was uh, not just a crime. It was a crime against the Constitution uh, and the rule of law. I think uh, Jack Smith's prosecutors take that and other matters seriously. And uh, as we've seen, the judges in the local district court here in a very, very uh, important way have ruled uh, that the people like Vice Pre former Vice President Pence and aides to Trump are going to have to testify on critical issues. So uh, that's the big deal. But this is a big deal in itself. And. I, I guess if you're trying to look at uh, what happened here, Donald Trump created a culture of political hate. And that's what's driven all of this. As he said, he thinks everything is mine, that only he knows these things. And so it's going to be not just a criminal investigation, but a look at who Trump is and what he meant to the country when he was president and what it would mean to the country if he, he was elected again. We are, we are, we're past uh, the top of the 8 o'clock hour on the East Coast. Central time zone, a lot of people just tuning in, waking up. It's 7 o'clock there, obviously 5 o'clock uh, out on the West Coast uh, for a, a huge day and news, a follow-up on, on the indictments that came out yesterday. Uh, and, and Jen, as, as we've been saying this morning, a line's been crossed here, uh, and it's a line that causes me grave concern uh, for the first time we've indicted a former president. Uh, but that's balanced against the grave concern of, of us allowing Americans to believe that anyone, based on their position, is above the law. Uh, and I suspect if the crime has been committed, if the crime's been committed, I suspect you look at Georgia, you look at Jack Smith's investigations. These are indictments. Uh, you look at the Mar-a-Lago uh, obstruction case. These are indictments that are, are most likely going to continue to come. Uh, and it's going to come to a man who began his political career by uh, pushing his followers to chant, lock her up, mm. and to mock and ridicule the use of the Fifth Amendment, uh, that constitutional right. And yet, he says it's, it's what the mob did, and yet that's how he spent the past year. And now it's Donald Trump who actually uh, is the, the first uh, ex-president to be indicted. Ironies abound, as always, uh, with him. Um, and, you know, we, if you, it feels a little perilous this morning. Um, his, you, mm -hmm. you understand that history's yeah. been made. It does, we're, we're definitely, you know, we are definitely going into uncharted territories. I think voters had their say in 20. They rejected him. Uh, courts had their say in 20, where judges had to rule on a lot of, uh, you know, false election fraud claims. Uh, they had their say, and now juries are going to have their say. You know, it's important to remember that this wasn't just Alvin Bragg, that uh, brought uh, charges against Donald Trump. Um, you know, a majority of jurors, we don't know how many yet, voted to indict him. Uh, you know, that likely same thing will play out in Atlanta. Uh, to say if the, if the special counsel moves forward in D.C., that will play out in D.C. These are actual American citizens that are that are weighing in now. Uh, so the democracy is going to that's another front of the democracy that Donald Trump is going to is going to test. And you hope that citizens and juries and then citizens in the country are going to be able to to handle this. I mean, that's far. He's testing us at all levels. And this is going to be yep. a big one when you consider I mean, we're going to have multiple trials going on, likely in a presidential campaign. Um, Trump as a defendant in courtrooms, that case down in Atlanta, I was in Atlanta this week, you know, 
they're going to indict a lot of people. Not they, they are going to indict. They're likely to indict what the recommendations were. We know we're at least a dozen people. Names we know probably. Um, this is like that next. This next 18 months between now and the presidential election are going to be really treacherous. Yeah.